Well, hello, everybody. I am sorry for the technical difficulty, and uh, if we could just make it even more difficult, uh, I am not going to be able to present the PowerPoint that I so painstakingly created for everybody, but that's the way it goes in time in the modern age. So, hello. My name is Steve Strauss. I am the Senior Small Business Columnist for USA Today. I am... Um, an author of 18 books with my latest book just coming out this last week. It's called Your Small Business Boom! Explosive Ideas to Grow Your Business, Make More Money, and Thrive in a Volatile World. <laughs> that sound great. Uh, and what we're going to do today, even old school, is we're going to do the opposite and create our own small business Boom. Well, first of all, I want to thank Dave uh, and the whole B2 SMB team, um, Small Biz Aid. How great is this that we all get to do this? I want to thank you for putting up, putting up with me, I, the technical problems we're having. Uh, and more importantly, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to work on your business, not just you know, as um, Michael Gerber said in his famous book, The E Myth. Far too many of us work in our business and not on our business. And what we're going to do today is do the opposite. Right? We're going to start working on our business. Um, so, and let me tell you how I got to this idea of do the opposite. You know, during COVID, um, you know, li like you, I saw so many of our small business brothers and sisters having a difficult time going out of business. <laughs> survived, and some thrived. Uh, and I spoke to, um, I interviewed, you know, entrepreneurs big and small, famous and not famous, everyone from Richard down. And uh, you know what? The ones who made it through COVID were doing something different. As, I was, as I'm saying here today, they did the opposite. You know, I have a story of a woman named Katie Capps. Katie owned a, owns, owns, present tense, a spa, um, series of spas in New York City. You know, it all, you know, that to stand out, you have to be different. And Katie's spa certainly were that. They had infrared light. That's what you were bathed in. And wow, how, how great was that? But March 2020, the COVID boogeyman hit us all. It hit Katie Caps' spa business. And almost overnight, she had to close eight spas. So what was she going to do? Um, she decided to do something she hadn't done at all, and that is do some e-commerce. She had, had made some infrared spa blankets, and they just upped their order, and they leaned into e-commerce, and all of a sudden, this very physical business became a digital business, and with everyone home and freaked out and nervous and knowing what was going on at the time, boy, the idea of having a spa blanket, an infrared blanket that makes you wet and cleans your pores and makes you feel better and all these things really struck a chord. And as a result, Katie invented a new profit center. And now that her spas are back open, she still makes more money and higher dose still makes more money with their e-commerce business than they ever did with their physical business. So now she has two big profit centers. The moral of the story is that booms happen. Booms do happen. If, if, it's done it, if other people have been able to do it, well, then we can do it too. It's a first-step boom process. We're going to see it in the mind. I'm looking at something you don't get to see. And here's the four-step boom process that we're going to go over today. Uh, one, we're going to understand what the conventional wisdom is. Then two, we're going to look into why doing the opposite is... Uh, the antidote to the conventional wisdom. Three, we're talking about actually making changes. It's easier than you think. Well, awesome. And it turns out it can be. Um, and then finally, we're going to dig into four or five or six different boom ideas and action things you can do that. Maybe not necessarily the opposite, but you get what I'm saying. Something new, different, creative, 
None of these ideas that I'm going to share with you are exceptionally expensive. They're all easy to try. You try some out. You find one that works. You find two that works. And all of a sudden, boom, you created a new profit center. You created a new way to make money. And uh, we got we'll put COVID on his heels. So damn you, COVID. All right, well, so let's go into the conventional wisdom of what people generally do during recessionary times, during tough times. You know, Paul Harvey had um, a great saying, the old late great media personality, Paul Harvey, and he said, in times like these, it's good to remember there have always been times like these. It's good to remember there have always been times like these. Look, have we been through a pandemic before? No, we have not, you know. Um, but our times, for sure. Um, but when there is a recession, like, for example, the Great Recession of 2008, or what I call the not-so-great recession, uh, what, is the, what is the general thinking? What is the conventional wisdom? Well, things are tough. It was the thinking right now. COVID is difficult. Small businesses are in trouble, and so we should retrench, wait it out, be prudent, avoid risks, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that does make sense, right? On, for, at first blush, retrenching, waiting it out, being prudent, avoiding risks, those things all work. But the problem with the conventional wisdom is that it's conventional. <laughs> and you know what I know about entrepreneurs is we tend not to be conventional. Um, do I want you to be Am I telling you to take a wild, crazy risk? Heck no. You know, all these entrepreneurs that I talk about that I meet all the time, the best ones, what they have in common is that they take risks, yes, because that's part of the game. That's part of the entrepreneurship deal that we make. But they take prudent, smart risks. And that's what we want to do. We want to figure out some prudent, smart risks. I mean, you know, this idea about the conventional wisdom, you you could I have a Dilbert cartoon that I looked at recently, and you know one of the panels is, have you ever noticed that things that don't kill you actually make you weaker, <laughs> not stronger? The conventional wisdom is they, they make you stronger. And what about this idea that great minds think alike? Well, maybe great minds don't think alike because if they did, the patent office would be full of about maybe you know, fifty <laughs> inventions. So you know, there's often times when the conventional wisdom doesn't work. And I'll give you a famous business example when we don't want to follow the conventional wisdom. Well, Polaroid, uh, not to date myself too much, but we, we all know what a Polaroid camera is, even though they're not nearly around as much. But Polaroid first invented the instant picture, right? If you think what about a Polaroid picture is, it's an instant picture. Right? Even after, excuse me, even after that, Polaroid invented a digital camera. But because it competed with their regular land camera, the regular pop the, the film out and watch it develop camera, they kind of sat on the digital thing and they didn't really think it was that big of a deal. They thought their camera was better. Well, they were just so used to doing things the way they'd always done them, uh, they weren't ready to do the opposite. And what I'm suggesting and what I know works, what I've seen work during COVID with these, you know, great strategies and secrets that are shared with me in your small business boom is it is the opposite that works. You know, it is I say the opposite, it really comes from that classic Seinfeld episode. You, you know, it's really one of the funniest, uh, most prescient episodes of Seinfeld. The gang is sitting around the coffee shop and George is of course lamenting the sad state of their life and um, close your eyes with me here. All right, and the waitress comes over and takes an order and says to George, Well, tuna on toast and coleslaw and a cup of coffee because that's what George always ordered. And George says yes because that is what he has always done. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, bravado, he says, No, <laughs> no, because nothing has ever worked for me with tuna on toast. And so he orders, but he gives me. I'm going to order a complete opposite of tuna on toast. And then there's uh, chicken salad on rye and toasted. <laughs> now, you know, chicken salad may or may not be the opposite of tuna on toast. Um, 
But the play is the same, right? Like doing what he's always done, George got what he's always he's gonna get what he's always got. You know, if you've ever watched the show, you know George Costanza. It's really, you know, a lot of nothing. So George orders the opposite, and right then, a beautiful woman at the counter turns and smiles at him. And he leaned out us, and, and she said, hey, George, go, 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 talk to him. She said, give you a big smile. And George said, no, Elaine, I can't. You don't understand. You know, I'm bald. I'm at home with my parents. And here is he. But if every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. And so George lights up, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do the opposite. You're right. He stands up, saunters over, says, look at the lady who'd smile him, and says, Hi, my name is George. I'm unemployed. I live with my parents. That's right. That's the opposite. And she looks up and smiles and says, Hi, I'm Victoria. And he gets a date with her, right? The idea, of course, is sometimes doing the opposite is exactly what works. You know, there's, there's the Berkeley Wellbeing Institute did um, some research into this idea of actually doing the opposite. And what they said, here's a quote. Doing the opposite of what you might normally do helps disrupt the well-worn pathways in your brain. By confusing the brain, we begin to break our patterns, create some new patterns. And that's what I think we need to do in our business as well. Because we all find patterns, especially with small business people, we learn a trick, we do it, you know, we come up with what I call a small business recipe. What's your small business recipe? It could be anything that... Uh, that makes, excuse me for the bad pun, that makes you your dough, right? That's your recipe. And it could be a stall at the Saturday market, or um, it could be, it could be, um, you know, an advertising thing that works, and um, it, it could be all sorts of different things. So we all have a recipe. The problem is most of us beat our recipes to death. And so what I'm suggesting, of course, here right now is to... Uh, do something different. Um, and I think that really is what works. Um, you know, Warren Buffett has a famous say, say, statement. And he said, be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. Right? And Winston Churchill, what did he say? Famously, Winston Churchill said, well, before I get to that, let me just say, so this idea of doing the opposite, what it really means is that there's opportunity here for us. In this crisis, in this bad time, in this thing we're all going through, there's opportunity. So Winston Churchill said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. We've, many of us have heard that sentence before, but I think it's really apropos here. And this almost sounds cliche at this point, this, this uh, sentence by John F. Kennedy, but it is true. Kennedy, in 1959, before he was president, he was speaking in New York, and he was talking about uh, problems with the Soviets at the time. And he said the Chinese used two brushstrokes to write the word crisis. One brushstroke stands for danger, and the other stands for opportunity. So in a crisis, we must be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. We must be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. And so... That's what we need to do. That's the thinking that we need to get into if we're going to actually do the opposite and take advantage of the opportunity that's available to us. Because look at after this pandemic, things are going to be different. We can already see how different the world is right now. Everyone's the, the eating outside thing isn't going away anytime soon, and that's just a physical manifest manifestation. People's shopping habits are different. Their, their, their buying habits are different. They're online, as we're going to get into here in a second. Or, or think back to the not-so-great recession, 2008, right? The, what was the conventional wisdom at that time? Bad time to start a business. Don't want to start a business. Don't take big risks. Uh, you know, that was, at that time, up until that time, the worst economic crisis in 50 years since the Great Depression. But you know what? Think about the companies that didn't listen and decided to do the opposite and who created an incredible um, companies that were created, invented, started during 2008, 2009. Uber, Venmo, Square, Instagram, 
Pinterest, uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp is kind of an amazing story too. You know, it could be really great. Brian acted in JNC. We're working for Facebook at this time, right before the recession, and they thought they, they thought they wanted to get a better job. Maybe they go uh, get a job with a different company, maybe Google, something like that. They couldn't get a different job. So all of a sudden, the recession had been and they're out of work and having a hard time finding work. But they had this idea for a new app, and they thought it was what there is a need for right now. You know, everyone was really getting into cell phones at the time. There's a need for a a, a app that's confidential, private, uh, that can work on any network that keeps your secrets secret or your your conversations confidential. They didn't have any experience creating an app. What did they do? Well, they did what you or I would do. They went on to something called rentacoder dot com, <laughs> and they found a they found a guy who's a coder. His name was Igor. Pull them in the class. They told them what they wanted the app to be. It was a private app. People were able to talk on it confidentially, blah, blah, blah. And they invented WhatsApp. And you know, three years later, uh, maybe this is about five years after they had the Facebook, Facebook bought their company for $19 billion. <laughs> a billion with a B. So that's what doing the opposite and taking advantage of the opportunity can do for us. You know, Mark Cuban, I think and we would all agree is a pretty prescient um, business person. And he says about the present moment that we're in right now, when we look back at the pandemic in 20 years, we're going to recognize that there were 20, 30, or more world-class companies that changed the game. I think this is a phenomenal time to create new opportunities in business. And I don't think, in fact, there's even been a better time to start a company. He said that last year, in the middle of, of, the, of the pandemic, he was talking about the pandemic and its related recession. So, hey, don't listen to Steve. Listen to Mark Cuban. He says there's never been a better time to start a business or grow your business. So, uh, awesome. Okay, Steve, like it? The question then is, you know, how do we make this change? Right, because it often feels like change is, you know, very difficult. Uh, you have to get buy-in from a bunch of people. You have to, you know, create new or, new, a new organization, hire people, take big risks. But what is making a change actually easier than you think? Because that's what I have learned, is that change can and make a big result. You know, probably the most successful college coach ever is uh, from my alma mater, UCLA, John Wooden. He was the greatest, probably the greatest basketball coach, maybe the greatest coach of all time. His team won, once won an astounding 88 games in a row. He won 10 championships in in uh, 12 years. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to go up against him. He was coach of the year a record seven times. And he, he created what's called the that was not just teaching, excuse me, teaching kids how to be great basketball players. They really teach great people how to be successful in their lives. And Bill Walton, one of the most famous UCLA grads ever, uh, and one of the, you know, could have gone on to be one of the great centers ever, tells this amazing story about which would not be so applicable to what we're talking about right now. He, you know, he tells a story that when he was a freshman his very first day. He went to practice and he was ready to, you know, get started. And John Wooden, not a young man at the time, you know, came out and says, All right, coach, all right, kids, we're going to learn how to tie our shoes. Uh, in fact, let me have Bill Walton tell you. I have his quote from his book right here. Coach Wooden called all the freshmen and walked us all into the locker room. He sat there like dutiful sponges. Ready to soak it all up, knowing that he's about to give us the keys to heaven and earth, show us the path, guide us to becoming the next great team in history. His first words were, Men, this is how you put your shoes on. <laughs> we were stunned. We looked around at each other. Are you kidding me? We were all high school, all American blue chip players. And here is this silly old man showing us how to tie our shoes and Put on our socks? Well, over the course of time, he showed us also 
how to tuck in our shorts properly, and how to tie a proper knot on the drawstrings of our game shorts, and then how to shower properly and dry ourselves, and how to practice properly, and how to study properly, and how to prepare for games, and how we should handle ourselves on and off the court. He showed us how to conduct our lives by teaching them from the beginning how to tie their shoe. What he was saying is the little things, and this is John Wooden's quote, little things are vital. Little things make the big things happen. Little things make the big things happen. And I have this similar quote by Vincent Van Gogh. And he says, great things are not done by impulse, but by a series of small things brought together. And if you ever look at a Van Gogh picture, right, it's these dabs and dabs and dabs of paint. Each individual little dab of paint seemingly is nothing, but put together, wow, some of the most beautiful art we've all ever seen. Great things are not done by impulse, but by a series of small, small things brought together. There is something called the trim tab effect, and this is how change is made. This is how I think about a change that I think we all need to make. I'm not saying you need to do it. This is what I've been doing in my business, and I'm telling people through my columns, through my speeches, in my book, what they need to do. And that is making a little change in the right direction to have a huge result. I want you to be a giant ocean tanker. Since we're doing theater of the mind, you know, theater in your mind, I want you to a giant ocean tanker going down the ocean. How does the captain turn that ocean tanker to go in a new direction? I mean, think about the you know, millions of tons of weight in inertia moving the you know, tanker in one direction. You, know, you think, oh, well, the captain just turns the wheel, and the wheel turns the rudder, and the rudder turns the ship in a new direction. That's an easy one, Steve. What are you talking about? But that's really not what happens, because there is so much pressure on the rudder at that depth um, that the wheel can't turn it. So, in fact, on the rudder is a little mini rudder called a trim tab. So when the captain turns the wheel, the wheel turns the mini rudder, the trim tab. The trim tab turns because there's less water pressure on it, creating kind of a low pressure area. That thus allows the bigger rudder to turn, and the bigger rudder be turns the whole ship into a new direction. If you can see my PowerPoint, I have some really great video graphics that would show you how this works. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it this way. So. That's the secret, the trim tab effect. A little change in the right place can make a big result. You can turn the whole, a whole ship, a ship of state, the ship of your business, the ship of your career, whatever it is, uh, in a whole new direction by using the trim tab effect. Think about something little you can do, start small, test it, see if it works, Try it out. If it does work, then you can roll it out in big new ways. That's how the great entrepreneurs do it. So I'm going to share four different explosive, booming ideas for you. And uh, the reason we want to think about the four that I'm going to share, though I'm going to have a couple more than four, but these are some digital ideas because that is where the eyeballs are. I mean, think about it. Online sales grew by 36% over the past 12 months. Um, in 2020, 70% of consumers said that they preferred shopping online. Only 41% said that pre-pandemic. So in these days, 70%, and I'm sure the number is probably even higher, 70% of people say that they would prefer to shop online. And this is not surprising. We've all heard this, and some of us may even know this. 63% of employees say they would rather quit than go back into the office. So the answer to all that is we want to be on what I call the right side of the digital divide. What is the digital divide? Well, pre-pandemic, some of us you know, used digital tools to grow our business, and some of us didn't. Some of us were into e-commerce. Some of us weren't. Some of us used pay-per-click and uh, Facebook ads and all these revolutionary tools that we can use to get people to learn about our business and buy from us. And, some of us didn't, but those who didn't today, post-pandemic, when everyone's online, where all eyeballs are online, you're on the wrong side of the digital divide. We want to be on the right side of the digital, digital divide and where things are going. In fact, it was that famous quote by Wayne Gretzky. Um, I skate to where the puck is going to be. 
not where it's been. All right, and it's kind of cliche, but boy, isn't it true? Well, there's there's a lot of lot of wisdom to be gleaned from that. So where is the puck going? Well, uh, I'm going to sh- share four different ideas that I think you might want to think about that can help you build your brand, grow your business, make a big have a, dig- a bigger digital footprint, and uh, take things to the next level. One is starting your own podcast. Two is creating your own webinar like this. Three is creating your own videos. And fourth is building a tribe. And that's a lot to talk about in a short period of time. But heck, we're going to do it. So, uh, and you know, and those are only four ideas, right? I mean, there's no shortage of ideas. We could do, let me, let me just share a couple of non-digital ideas. What about getting bigger clients? One of the biggest things you could do to grow your business, take it to the next level, is look for bigger clients with bigger budgets. One problem most small businesses have is that many, not most, also many, is they sell to either consumers or to other small businesses. And the problem with consumers or nonprofits or other small businesses businesses is they great because we're a small business and we're you know creative and interesting and personal and attentive. Those are all the great things, but we we tend to have smaller budgets than our larger corporate partners. So one of the things to do is think about how to get corporate clients, government clients, high net worth individuals. By finding bigger clients, they're going to have bigger budgets, they're going to pay you more money. Um, I use that strategy. I show you how to do in the book, how to find these kind of clients. Quadrupled my income once over a two-year period. That was an amazing strategy. Or in the four-hour work week, Tim Ferriss tells a story about how he did an 80-20 analysis. We've all heard of the 80-20 rule, but what he wanted to figure out was, this was before he was really, you know, Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss. You know, he had a business where he was selling stuff. And what what 20% of his products and what 20% of his clients made him 80% of his money? That's what he wanted to figure out. He sat down for a day and looked at all of his 100 clients. And he realized, oh, there's only four or five or eight who really make me a lot of money. The rest of them take a lot of my time, and they sure don't help me. And he figured out what those eight clients had in common, those 10 clients had in common. And then he went looking for more people like that. And so all of a sudden, he was able to do the four-hour work week, although uh, you know, if you're like me and you watch his blog or listen to his podcast you know, and watch, you see him out there, you think, oh, maybe Tim Ferriss doesn't really work four hours. I'm sure he doesn't really work four hours, but the idea is important. And that is we could be more effective. We can get bigger clients by thinking about who our ideal client is and going out and finding them. How do we find them? Well, one, if you have a great brand, and maybe they'll find you. But two, LinkedIn, an amazing tool for going to finding the right clients. Find, look for the right client. Earmark them and say, those three corporations would love what I have to sell, and I could really help them. And if you could really help them, go on to LinkedIn and see if you know someone who knows them. Go on to their website. You know, pitch yourself. It's, you know, good old-fashioned boots to the ground, sending emails, sending proposals, that kind of thing. But, boy, by finding bigger clients, you can uh, really take things to the next level. You know, and this is the same for larger small businesses as well as solopreneurs. Lots of ways to kick it into the next level. But let's talk about this podcast idea. One of the things I love about podcasting is it is what I call brand-tastic. And what is brand-tastic? It helps you build your brand. Look, if you're going to find these bigger clients, yes, one way is to go out and find them, but a better way is to have them find you. And how are they going to find you? Well, that is because they have such a great brand that people want to seek you out. And here's this guy, John Lee Dumas. If you're listening to um, entrepreneurship podcasts or small business podcasts, his, um, his John Lee Dumas is called Entrepreneurs on Fire and he calls it Fire Nation, uh, is probably the most popular. But John, and I was just on his show, happily to say, about my book, but John started his podcast 10 years ago. He knew nothing about podcasting. He had no customers. He had no listeners. But he thought, you know what I think would be unique and different and special, and that's one thing I keep saying to you, you've got to be unique, different, and special so you can stand out. What he thought would be unique, different, and special would be to have a daily podcast for entrepreneurs, interviewing entrepreneurs. So every day on his show, he has an entrepreneur, right? And he talks to a small business person about how they did it, how they grew it. So it's really pretty cool. And these days, 
on his website, on eofire.com, that's Entrepreneurs on Fire, eofire.com, he has a spreadsheet. And he tells you how much money he makes every month and every year. And these days, his podcast is making him a million dollars a year, and he has a million listeners a month now. And this guy started with no listeners, no money, out of work, but with an idea and a passion. So, and also he created a great name for himself. I think John Dumas goes looking for work. Oh, no. Work comes looking for John Dumas. That's the value of putting on a podcast. Now, um, are, they, are there a lot of podcasts? You bet. But, and that is the good news and the bad news. The good news is they're popular. And the bad news is they're, they're popular, right? Um, but look, at it. think about the different benefits you could get by starting your own show. And starting your own show is really easy. They are incredibly uh, popular. Um, they are financially or can be financially lucrative. They build your business brand. This one is not insignificant. They build your personal brand. Think about it. If you have a show in your industry, let's say you um, you sell uh, swimming pool and spa equipment. Well, you could have a spa show, uh, and you could have experts in your industry come on, and you could have people might want to listen to how to have better spa experiences and things like that. You don't think there's uh, a market for it? Of course there is. You need to pay this to it, and. By becoming the spa expert, because you have the show, people come on your show, and you're doing the one doing the interviewing, all of a sudden, your name and brand and your gravitas are going to go to the next level. So, um, you know, having a podcast can take you and make you a rock star in your industry. They're easy and affordable to create. Um, really, you can do it on your own with your cell phone using something like anchor.fm, that's anchor.fm. Uh, or GarageBand, if you have a Mac, you can use GarageBand. When I had my podcast, and I had a podcast for eight years, uh, I found a studio engineer. Uh, I just went on Craigslist, and there's a studio here in my town, because I didn't want to do all the tech stuff, I just wanted to do the fun stuff. And he would have the guests, the engineer, and then after the show was over, he'd, he'd mix it, make it sound great, post it to iTunes, and then we would market it. And boy, that was a great way for me to, one, build my brand, uh, learn about more people, learn about new people in my industry, uh, and make money. I ended up with some really great sponsors. Microsoft was a sponsor of my show for a while, uh, Greatland, SAP. So that is all possible. You, you too can create a podcast. Or what about, and I'm talking about digital ideas, that it's going to build your name, build your brand, get your business out there, allow you to get bigger clients. That is what I'm dialed into right now. What about creating your own webinar, like this one, <laughs> uh, or an event, right? We webinars are also fantastic. They have huge reach. And look, at we're reaching so many people today with this great event that Dave and the B to SMB team is putting on. Um, they're engaging when you're listening to it, right? They're informative. You know, webinar content is substantive. It's valuable, and and it, by the way, can help you grow your list. I mean, one, I'll get into that in a second, but. From a branding, growing your business perspective, webinars are super, super valuable. Uh, you can really be seen as the expert. It takes 45 minutes to an hour. When else online, you get someone's attention for 45 minutes to an hour, and they're paying attention to what you have to say. They want to hear what you have to say. Um, it can be visual if you're better than me at technical stuff. Um, and they can grow your list. By, uh, by signing up for your webinar, People are going to opt in. You're going to grow your list. And that list really is another tool that you can use down the road to sell more webinars or inform people, let them know what you're doing. Webinars are great. And they're pretty easy. All you have to do is decide on a topic. You can pick a platform, um, whether it's BlueJeans, Zoho Meeting, uh, Zoom, GoToWebinar, ReadyTalk. There's all sorts of platforms you can use. And you create a PowerPoint or you create a, an outline. You practice and then you market it. All of a sudden, you're going to be the expert. People are going to come to your webinar. They're going to learn your stuff. They're going to buy whatever it is you sell. And uh, you, again, are an expert on the, on the next class. Third idea is video. Um, and I want you to think about putting video on your website, on your social, using it in your e-newsletter because video really gets you some attention. I have a couple stats here I want to share. Eighty-five percent of people say that videos help them better connect with a brand. 44% say they're more likely to buy a product after watching a video about it, 
81% say video is the most preferred type of content uh, on social media. Um, and people definitely spend more time on sites with video. Uh, in fact, and this is the stat I love the most, you're 53 times more likely to get a page one Google ranking via SEO if you have video on that page. So you put a video on a page and then you blast it out, Google is going to notice it, the Google algorithm is going to notice it, and your likelihood of getting um, notice is going to be much higher. You can make videos, you can make explainer videos, product demonstrations, whiteboards, but make some videos, they don't have to be perfect. on the YouTube age, they're on, the, on the cell phone video age, they don't have to be perfect, they have to be nice, professional, put your brand out there in a great way, um, but you do that and put it out there and put it in your new e-newsletter. E-newsletters, of course, also get clicked at a much higher rate if you use video. And you can post them on your website, like I said, on YouTube, video, social media, in your newsletter, on other sites. And then the fat last idea I want to share with you is creating a tribe of loyal customers. You know, there's a guy named Kevin Kelly. Uh, people, these are people who really believe in your business, not just frequent your business, but really believe in it. And there's a quote, there's a famous essay by Kevin Kelly called 1,000 True Fans, and I, and I really encourage you to Google it after, later, after we're done. 1,000 True Fans, and his basic quote is, to be successful as a creator, you don't need millions. To make, be an entrepreneur, you don't need millions of people. To make a living as a craftsman, photographer, musician, designer, author, animator, app maker, entrepreneur, inventor, all you need are 1,000 True Fans. And he says, making a, creating 1,000 fans, there is easier than for trying to create a million followers, right? And you can create a couple a day, in a couple of years, you're gonna have a thousand free fans, and these are the people where you send out an e-newsletter to them about your sale, they love you, they're gonna come by from you. A thousand people who wanna hear from you, that's kind of an incredible thing. So that part of that is just building your list with your e-newsletters, getting people to opt in with contests, with content, with webinars, with podcasts, you get people to opt in, give them value, 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 and they are going to do it. So uh, I interviewed a gentleman in the book. His name is Joel Kong. And Joel was been at the forefront of Twitter. He wrote a best-selling Twitter book called Twitter Power 10 years ago. Um, now these days, he's, of course, into what's the latest, cryptocurrency and NFTs. He has something called the Nifty Show, which is his podcast. He has his that crypto uh, podcast. He only creates these amazing tribes. And so I asked him, I interviewed him. I said, Joel, how do you do it? How do you always create this? group of people who believe in you. Well, he says, pick a platform, whether it's podcasting, webinars, writing, video, whatever works for you, and then record a damn show, <laughs> which is kind of like, you know, Nike, like, just do it. You know, we can analyze, we can get into analysis, paralysis, or we can not. But you record a damn show, you get it out there, you figure it out, you make some mistakes, and there you go. All right, I have um, run out of time, and I, well, I'm not sure we can answer, do any questions that I don't have the the app in front of me, but uh, if you want to contact me, you can learn about my book and learn about me at smallbusinessboom.com. That's smallbusinessboom.com. Uh, or you can email me at strauss at mralbiz.com. And I say that, I have to spell that out to me at the end of the day. That's S-S-T-R-A-U-S-S -S -S at M-R-A-L-L. Be like boy, iz.com. Estraza, Mr. Albus. Happy to answer your questions. And sorry for the technical difficulties. But I hope I gave you some food for thought. Let's do the opposite. Go to the next level. Create our own small business room. Thanks so much.